नमस्कार वेलकम टू सनसर टीवी आई एम योर होस्ट भावना नैयर यू आर वाचिंग डेमोक्रेसीज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड द शो वे वी टेक यू थ्रू द लेटेस्ट हैपनिंग्स फ्रॉम पार्लियामेंट अक्रॉस द ग्लोब इन दिस एडिशन वी ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट हैपनिंग्स फ्रॉम द इलेक्शंस इन जापान एंड जर्मनी वी विल आल्सो टॉक अबाउट सेवरल फर्स्ट इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ मेनी कंट्रीज ट्यूनीजिया हैज बिकम द फर्स्ट कंट्री इन द अरब वर्ल्ड टू अपॉइंट अ फीमेल प्राइम मिनिस्टर एंड कतर हेल्ड इट्स फर्स्ट लेजिस्लेटिव इलेक्शंस First up news from Japan where the country's parliament elected Fumio Kishida former foreign minister as the next prime minister Kishida replaces outgoing party leader and prime minister Yoshihide Suga who is stepping down after serving only 1 year since taking office last September the newly appointed prime minister faces the task of reviewing a pandemic hit economy and ensuring a strong alliance with Washington to counter growing regional security risks from China and North Korea General election in the country are scheduled for October 31. Eh, 第100代内閣総理大臣に指名されました岸田文雄です。自民主党と公明党の連立による新たな内閣が。Newly elected Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said he will dissolve the lower house next week in preparation for the October 31 elections as he seeks a fresh mandate to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, the sagging economy and the security threats from China and North Korea. Kishida supports stronger Japan-US security ties and partnerships with other like-minded democracies in Asia, Europe and Britain. In his first press conference after his appointment, Kishida acknowledged the importance to continue dialogue with China, an important neighbor and trade partner, but said that we must speak up against China's attempt to change the status quo in the East and South China Seas. Everyone has been affected by the corona, and has been affected by the corona. In this situation, we have to be able to work together and work together. An advocate for nuclear disarmament, he escorted former U.S. President Barack Obama during his 2016 visit to Hiroshima. He struck a 2015 agreement with South Korea to resolve a row over the issue of women who were sexually abused by Japan's military during the Second World War, part of a legacy that still hampers relations between both countries. Meanwhile for the first time in Tunisia's history a woman will head a government Tunisian president Kai Said named Nazla Boudin Romdani a little known university engineer who worked with the World Bank as the country's first woman prime minister nearly 2 months after he sacked the previous government Romdani will take office at a time of national crisis and a major threat looms over public finances on 25th July Said sacked the government of Hichi Mishishi suspended parliament lifted MP's immunity and took over the judiciary after months of political deadlock in the face of a pressing economic crisis and mounting coronavirus deaths 63 year old Najla Boudin is a former director of a education reform project and has held senior positions at Tunisia's higher education ministry she was born in Tunisia's central Kairouan province in 1958 Romadani is a geology professor at the National School of Engineers in the capital Tunis and does not have any political affiliations. In Qatar results of the first ever legislative council election was announced on Sunday with none of the 26 female candidates winning at the polls. It is to be noted that among 233 candidates that stood in the polls across 30 districts only 26 were women. On October 2, Qatar held its first ever legislative elections to elect 45 members of its advisory and legislative body, the Shura Council, which has been in place since 1972. The Shura Council approves general state policies and the budget. However, it has no say in the setting of defense, security, economic and investment policy. The Interior Ministry said in a statement that turnout for the election of 30 members of the 45-seat body was 63.5%. The MR will continue to appoint the remaining 15 council members. Electionary is in the full swing for the October 8th parliamentary elections in the Czech Republic. 
It will be the nation's 10th democratic elections for the Chamber of Deputies, the lower chamber of parliament since 1989. Eighth since it became independent after the dissolution of Czechoslovakia in 1993. All 200 members will be elected and the leader of the resulting government will become the Prime Minister. Post-2017 election, the Czech Republic was led by a minority government that had the ANO and the Social Democratic Party with support from the Communist Party. The largest opposition party is the Civic Democratic Party followed by the Czech Pirate Party. Much is at stake in this election that will indicate the direction Czech foreign policy will take. Let's take a look at the major political parties contesting in the polls. Major political parties in these elections include ANO. The ANO party won the 2017 election with 29.6% of the vote. It is headed by Andre Babish, the current Prime Minister. Pirates and Mayors This grouping is the electoral alliance between the Pirate Party and the Mayors and Independents, Stan. The Pirate Party is considered a party of young, city-dwelling liberals, while Stan draws its support mainly from voters in smaller towns. SPOLU It is an alliance of the Civic Democratic Party, Top 09 and the Christian Democrats. Czech Social Democratic Party The Social Democrats, who led governments from the late 1990s to the mid-2000s, are now grappling with the possibility of not gaining any seats in the Chamber of Deputies for the first time since the Velvet Revolution. Freedom and Direct Democracy the Freedom and Direct Democracy Party was founded in 2015 by Tomio Okamura, a businessman with Japanese roots. Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia is the ideological heir to the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia that ruled the country between 1948 and 1989. Prisaha, meaning the oath, is a new outfit on the Czech political scene. A week after the Germany's parliamentary election, the main four parties are starting formal coalition talks. The conservative CDU and the center-left Social Democrat Party are both seeking to lead the new government. Germany's conservative party suffered a historic defeat in the recently concluded general election, marking the end of the dominant role of the conservatives led by the incumbent Chancellor Angela Merkel for over a decade in the federal parliament. One week after the German election, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor candidate of centre-left Social Democratic Party, said that he would seek to form a so-called traffic light coalition with the Green Party and the Free Democratic Party after the SPD won the nail-biting general election on Sunday. The SPD emerged as the party with the most seats in the September 26 election, but only marginally ahead of the centre-right union. Both parties would need to form a coalition with two others, namely the Greens and FDP, to reach the Chancellery. According to the provisional election results, the SPD scored 25.7% of the votes, beating its main rival, the Conservative Union Christian Democratic Union and its sister party Christian Social Union. The SPD's share of the votes surged by 5.2 percentage points from four years ago, while the CDU-CSU union took only 24.1% of the votes, 8.9 percentage points lower than that of the last election. Meanwhile, the Green Party received 14.8% of the votes in the election, making it the third largest political faction in Parliament, followed by the business-friendly FDP with 11.5%. The provisional election results have indicated a more fragmented Parliament, in which parties have to scramble for alliances to cross the threshold of having 50% of all seats. After the election four years ago, it took over 170 days for the new federal government to be sworn in. Germany is a federal democracy with strong political parties, an independent judiciary and powerful regional and local governments. The country has 16 states and a population of over 80 million although Germans don't directly elect a new chancellor. They place two votes to determine the shape of parliament every four years. Let us understand how the German parliamentary system works and how its decisions are made. Germany is a federal parliamentary republic. Its constitution that was framed in 1949 laid down the Grundgesetz or basic law. 
The basic law saw minor amendments after the reunification of Germany in 1990. The German constitution sets down the rights of people, describes functions of the president, cabinet, parliament and the courts. Voting is the most important German political right. Non-citizens are generally not able to vote in most elections. Every German citizen over the age of 18 is eligible to vote. Parliamentary elections are held every 4 years. Executive, legislative and judiciary are the three wings of Germany's federal government. The legislative branch includes two chambers of parliament, the Bundesrat which is the federal council and the Bundestag or the federal diet. The Bundestag, the parliament of Germany, is the legislative branch of the government based in Berlin. It is the heart of democracy in the Federal Republic of Germany. Every 4 years, Germans elect members of the Bundestag in parliamentary elections. The Bundestag has 598 seats, although that number can fluctuate due to the parliament system. Germans cast two votes on election day. The first vote is for candidates in their constituency. The second vote is for the political party. Half of Bundestag is made up of candidates from the country's 299 constituencies. The first voter is easier to understand. It uses a simple majority rule under which the candidate who gets the highest number of votes wins the seat. The rest of the parliament comes from the second vote for political party lists. Each party presents a list of candidates in each of Germany's 16 federal states or lande. The number of seats in each land is determined by its population. Seats as given to parties based on the proportion of the second vote they receive in that land. A political party has to receive at least 5% second votes in a state to qualify for a seat. The 5% threshold is meant to prevent smaller parties from entering parliament. Total second votes determine how many candidates reach parliament. The high figure between the first and second votes determines a party's minimum number of seats. Generally, the number of seats in Bundestag exceeds 598. After the 2017 election, the Bundestag had 709 seats instead of 598. These balanced seats are in place to ensure that no party holds an unfair advantage over others. In such scenarios, political parties often have to negotiate after the elections to form a majority coalition that can lead the government. Once a coalition is formed, MPs then use their majority to elect the chancellor. The chancellor is appointed by the federal president and voted on by the Bundestag in a secret vote. In order to be elected, the federal chancellor must win an absolute majority of votes known as the chancellor majority. The federal president then appoints the chancellor within 7 days of the election. The chancellor serves 4 year terms and does not have term limits. The judiciary of Germany is independent of the executive and the legislature, while it is common for leading members of the executive to be members of the legislature as well. Welcome back you're watching Democracies of the World. Queen Elizabeth spoke of her deep and abiding affection for Scotland as she officially opened the 6th session of the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh on October 2. At the start of the ceremony, she congratulated the parliament for being able to mark the new session safely in a very trying period and noted that it had been a heart of this Scotland's response to the pandemic. She urged MSPs to work together to despite their differences of opinion celebrating people who have made an extraordinary contribution during the pandemic the queen noted the countless examples of resilience and goodwill that have made a difference to others Marking this new session does indeed bring a sense of beginning and renewal The Scottish Parliament has been at the heart of Scotland's response to the pandemic with people across this country looking to you for leadership and stewardship and i hope you will remain at the forefront as we move towards a phase of recovery while some of you will have differences of opinion i trust you will continue to work together in a speech ahead of the cop 26 Climate Conference Queen Elizabeth also urged Scotland's MSPs to tackle climate change and help create a better, healthier future. Next month, I will be attending COP26 events in Glasgow. The eyes of the world will be on the United Kingdom and Scotland in particular, 
as leaders come together to address the challenges of climate change. There is a key role for the Scottish Parliament, as with all parliaments, to help create a better, healthier future for us all, and to engage with the people they represent, especially our young people. Sustainable peace and development are essential to the future of the planet and humanity. This vision is laid out in the 2030 Agenda by the United Nations for Sustainable Development. It aims to end poverty, build peaceful societies and people's well-being while protecting the environment for current and future generations. The Inter-Parliamentary Union, along with the Parliament of Indonesia, organized the first global parliamentary meeting on achieving the sustainable development goals from September 20th to 30th. The meeting brought together the parliaments to discuss how they can advance implementation of the SDG through innovative action and cooperation. Take a look. Sustainable development goals are the universal roadmap to end poverty and protect the planet. However, COVID-19 outbreak has affected progress on these 17 goals and in some cases, the pandemic has even reversed this progress. Mobilizing parliaments around sustainable development goals has therefore become increasingly urgent, especially since only a few years are left to implement the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is in this context that from 28th to 30th September, around 70 parliaments representing all the regions of the world attend in the first global parliamentary meeting on achieving SDGs. The three-day meet had the theme of turning the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic into opportunities for parliaments to achieve the SDGs. The debates focused on key issues that determine progress on SDG implementation. They included the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, inequalities, universal health coverage and health emergency preparedness, economic transformation and SDG financing. Dozens of parliamentarians shared their experiences through virtual means with a wider group of stakeholders that included experts from the United Nations, academicians and others. The Speaker of Indonesian House of Representatives called on Parliament to encourage their respective governments and society to strengthen international cooperation, global solidarity and mutual respect. UN's Deputy Secretary General suggested that parliaments continue to support governments in their sustainable development goals. After the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, as the international community collectively faced the convergence of health, economic and social crises, parliaments rose to the challenge. You helped oversee the actions of governments to manage and respond to this unprecedented crisis, enacted appropriate legislation, adopted budgets to fight the pandemic and protect the most vulnerable and ensured that governments are accountable to their public. As the pandemic still rages, parliaments must continue to play this role. I urge you to double your efforts towards facilitating the just transitions that are needed to achieve the SDGs. As we are nearing 2030, it's vital to put the SDGs at the very centre when we speak of growth. Um, and I truly believe that members of parliaments across the world, you know, we play a very significant role in ensuring that this happens uh, going forward. And with the example of Indonesia, there are essentially 11 commissions at the Indonesian parliament, um, all dealing with different sectors uh, and all having uh, relevance uh, when we talk about the SDGs. The current crisis is threatening decades of development gains completely alter, alter our priorities, exacerbated inequalities, and further delayed the urgent transition to a greener and more inclusive economies. The COVID-19 pandemic has strong progress on SDGs even farther off the track. This means only one thing. We must act now and we must build back better. The United Nations General Assembly adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2015. 193 member countries, including India, committed to the 17 goals. 
all countries adopted a set of goals to end poverty, protect the planet, fight inequalities and tackle climate change. All this while ensuring that no one was left behind. The SDGs are now known as Global Goals. They build on the success of the Millennium Development Goals and try to go further to end all forms of poverty. The new goals are unique as they call on all countries, poor, rich and middle income, to promote prosperity while protecting the planet. Countries have been made responsible to review their progress in implementing these goals that will require quality, accessible and timely data collection. That's all we have in this edition of Democracies of the World. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Namaskar.